Uh, some thank yous, uh, first to the College of Music at Michigan State and the Stanley and Selma Hollander Musicology Fund uh, for supporting this event and to my colleague Lynn Geringer for organizational support. Uh, but my biggest thanks is to our speaker, uh, Maria Senovitsky, who agreed on extremely short notice to take part in what we thought would be a small informal discussion at Michigan State uh, that has now grown to a webinar with close to 300 people from across the country. Uh, our speaker, Maria Senovitsky, is Associate Professor of Anthropology and Music at Bard College. Her research focuses on post-Soviet Ukraine, where she has pursued interests including folklore revivals after state socialism and the effects of the Chernobyl disaster on the revival of rural musical repertories. In 2011, to commemorate the 25th anniversary of the Chernobyl catastrophe, she founded the uh, uh, Chernobyl Songs Project, a public ethnomusicology program that sought to broaden awareness about the cultural impact of nuclear disaster by reviving ritual song repertories from communities near the accident site. The project culminated with uh, multimedia performances in four cities and a Smithsonian Folkways recording. Uh, she is the author of Wild Music, a wonderful book, uh, Sound and Sovereignty in Ukraine, winner of the Lewis Lockwood Award from the American Musicological Society, and has also published a number of journal articles and book chapters. Uh, she performs frequently as an accordionist, vocalist, and pianist. Previously, she was associate professor at the University of California, Berkeley, and held postdoctoral positions at the Harvard Ukrainian Research Institute and the University of Toronto Center of European, Russian, and Eurasian Studies. Uh, please join me in giving a warm virtual welcome to Professor Maria Senovitsky. Hi, everyone. Dobry den. Kevin, thank you so much uh, for organizing this on such short notice as well. Thank you to anyone who's listening right now, whether it's in real time or after the fact, um, and for caring enough to be here. This last week has felt five years long for many of us who have family, friends, and colleagues in Ukraine. It is a time of intense Many of us have lost many hours of sleep, I include myself in that. It is a time of warring narratives. So I don't profess to be the keeper of a single, single unitary narrative that will all leave us all feeling comfortable and secure. But what I can do is underline a few different narratives that put Ukraine and Ukrainians at the center. And I'll use musical examples for this purpose, which will also give us an opportunity to listen together. I hope my internet cooperates. So I want to begin with a few general comments, and I'm going to aim this talk uh, for 45 minutes, but I haven't had an opportunity to time it, so I'm just going to do my best in that regard. Um, so first, this is geared for a broad audience. There's no fancy academic footwork here, um, but there are other avenues for that. Because this is broad, I'm going to move quickly over some big themes that have histories of debate and scholarship, and so we can also talk um, more about uh, that in the Q&A, if you'd like. Um, this is not going to offer a comprehensive picture of Ukrainian music, but I do hope it will encourage you to explore more. So for today, I chose four songs that allow me to talk about many of the dominant narratives that are circulating as Putin conducts war on, on, on Ukraine. And with such a narrow selection, I'm obviously excluding so much complexity and thousands of other examples that could amplify different aspects of the history of Ukraine. If you care most about folk revivals or classical music, I'm sorry that I had to exclude those today. I wanna to say that war is dehumanizing. Enemy is a dehumanizing term. My Russian friends, my Russianist colleagues have been some of the most compassionate to me during this time, even as their own family, friends and colleagues are facing an economy that is imploding, a war that is not in their names, often waged against their own families in Ukraine and a tyrant who is on what appears to be a suicide mission. Um, so I would just wanna say we would do well not to paint all Russians as enemies at this moment. 
War can also dehumanize the other side. So as much as we may wish to take comfort in believing that Ukrainians are superhumans, they are also full, complex, and real people with extremely complex historical inheritances. President Zelensky of Ukraine, in all of his recently deserved social media praise, is a real person with children and his own complex history. So I want to caution against dehumanizing in both of these directions. Music may seem like too soft a topic for this moment, but I do think it can at least help us humanize Ukrainians. And importantly, these musical examples that I'll talk about reveal a centuries long history that is Ukrainian, not Russian, not anything else. These examples should allow us to refute Putin's narrative about the illegitimacy of the Ukrainian project and to understand why there is such vociferous opposition on the side of Ukrainians to be absorbed back into this revanchist imperialist project that is motivating this war. So before we get to the music, I wanted to show you a map. Um, these are the borders of Ukraine as it looked before 2014 when the Russian war on Ukraine can really be said to have started this time. So this map includes Crimea, the peninsula that's jutting out into the Black Sea on the south, and the eastern border regions of Donbass and Luhanshina um, that have been enmeshed in conflict also since 2014. This map also represents the territory of independent Ukraine after 1991, that is the post-Soviet state of independent Ukraine. So the first caveat is no historian of Ukraine would argue that this is a trans-historical, transcendent state structure, but neither would any good historian argue the same about Italy or Russia or any other modern state for that matter. However, this does represent the borders that Russia guaranteed not to violate after signing the Budapest Memorandum on Security Assurances in 1994, and this was in exchange for Ukraine's relinquishing of its Soviet-era nuclear arsenal. Um, Put, uh, Putin's Russia violated uh, this agreement first in March of 2014, when little green men, that was soldiers without insignia, infiltrated the Crimean Peninsula and forced a vote on annexation under gunpoint. In the looking glass version of this story circulated by Russian state media, Crimea's annexation and the war stoked in Ukraine's east were spontaneous uprisings against what they called a fascist or neo-Nazi coup in 2013. This is the same event that most Ukrainians refer to as the revolution of dignity. So one more map. Um, this map is a historical ethnographic map of Ukraine. And so I want to say that this kind of map, this is an ethnographic representation and it is, a, it is evidence of a project of national consolidation. This is an attempt to take diverse regional styles and make them coherent as the kind of whole. This is entirely typical of modern nation building projects around the world in the 20th century. I'm sharing it here because I won't have time today to share these diverse regional traditions, um, but there are deep archives of this material and right now an attempt to save some of those archives um, in cloud storage that is being led in part by the graduate student uh, Irina Voloshina in Indiana, who is doing tremendous work. I want to also underscore that this kind of a map is also exclusionary in that it does not include many of the important important minority in a part of the fabric of your centuries. And that includes the Roma population, the Jewish population, and the Crimean population, none of whom are really accurately represented here. Ukraine has always been multi-ethnic, multi-confessional, and it has always had diverse linguistic practices. Okay, so on to the first song. This song, it's called Nema Usviti Pravde. There is no truth in the world. So I'm gonna talk about some of the themes that I want this song to illustrate, and then we'll listen to an excerpt of this performance. And I want to thank here uh, Julian Kitasti, who took time out of his day two days ago to make sure that I had some of these details right. This is not usually what I speak publicly about. 
So the first point I want to make is the traditional repertoire here is thought to date back as far as the 16th century. So this should be clear evidence to begin with, right, that there is a history here. This is specifically tied to the, his, the left bank Ukrainian history of the Hetmanate, the Kozak steppe culture. Um, the Kozaks are considered as anti-imperialist fighters. Um, due to 19th century nationalist projects, especially the popularization um, of, these, of these bard figures by roman the romantic poet hero Shevchenko, the bards became icon icons of Ukrainian identity into the 20th century. There's a whole family tree of musical practices that we could connect um, to th the music that you're about to hear. And this includes this bard tradition that I just mentioned, which often included epic songs that encoded local histories, dume, humorous songs, often body ones, religious songs, uh, kante. There's a tradition of what's called kobzarstvo, which is really a 19th century professionalized practice where um, minstrels, these blind minstrels would work together in guilds. And there's a 20th century, 19th and 20th century urban bandura tradition. So bards were victims of Stalinist repression in the 1930s. And the Soviets introduced a highly folklorized version of these practices that became largely scrubbed of the kind of Ukrainian particularities. Um, on the screen, you'll also see an image of uh, Kozak Mamai. That's uh, a kind of secular icon of Kozak music that circulates widely in many forms and also dates back centuries. So there's a revival practice associated with everything I've just named that has been quite robust in modern Ukraine. Um, the Kobzarsky Tsekh, uh, in which Taras Kompanichenko has been leading, uh, based in Kyiv, Yuri Fedinsky's revival projects in Poltava region, so many others. Um, and this revival scene includes instrument rebuilding, the reimagining and revival of traditional repertoires, including Baroque music practices and more. The excerpt I will play you is taken, it's a VHS recording that was converted, so the quality is not wonderful, but it's a VHS recording that was made at the Chervona Ruta Festival of Music in 1989. This festival was depicted by Soviet authorities in 1989, so two years before the Soviet Union fell, as a hotbed of Ukrainian nationalist organizing. This image of a threatening Ukrainian nationalism is a narrative that is so firmly in entrenched often blown way out of proportion and made into a kind of hysteria by Soviet propagandists and now Putin's propagandists as well. Chervona Ruta as a festival is an important moment in Ukrainian musical history. It was a showcase of Ukrainian musicians and artists, um, primarily done in the Ukrainian language it was a significant act at the time. It also included um, people like Julian who traveled from um, the United States to take part. Chervona Ruta, the name of the festival, means red rue flower, and it is the title of a much beloved Ukrainian song that was popularized in the 1970s by Sofia Rotaru and was written originally by Volodymyr Ivasyuk, who was murdered under highly suspicious circumstances in 1979, uh, largely believed uh, for his pro Ukrainian views. So I already mentioned. Julian Katasti, the Bandura player here. Uh, his family came from Southern Poltava region and were part of an urban Bandura tradition. I met him first in New York where he lives in an apartment referred to by many lovingly as Banduristan. So there are many waves of Ukrainian migrants to North America and other parts of the world fleeing oppressive regimes very often. It depended on the wave, but often that's the case. And um, so this means also that many people in the Ukrainian diaspora have family, often extended family in Ukraine today. And that is true for me as well. About truth claims. The song itself is called, There's No Truth in the World. Falsehood has taken the place of truth. The song is fundamentally about how power shapes the perception of truth. 
it is eerily appropriate for this moment. He goes back to 1700, when the old Kozak order was being demolished and replaced by a Russian imperial and other imperial threats. Uh, the, the song is really about how there is no truth any longer. You cannot get real justice in this world. It laments the end of what then was believed to be a fairly egalitarian order, but it also ends with a hopeful message that in the end, falsehood will be vanquished. So the anthropologist of Haiti, Michel Rolf Triot, has wrote famously that every truth claim is a claim to history. And I think this song is evidence of a claim to a kind of sovereign Ukrainian history that is centuries long. So now we're gonna to listen to this recording from 1989. right that there's no sound Everyone can hear me, right? I'm gonna turn my video back on. Thank you. Thank you for the messages in the chat. That was very helpful. And I'm very moved to see some uh, many familiar names and many unfamiliar names. It's, it's wonderful to see you here. Um, I think the other examples may have higher quality sound. So hopefully that will be better as well. Okay, uh, the second example I wanna talk about to bring a little levity <laughs> into this space. Um, is the song Tansi, meaning dances. Um, this is a song by the band Vokli Vidoplasova. Uh, fans call them Veve, so you can just call them Veve. This became a kind of huge hit of the uh, rock music subculture in the last years of the Soviet Union. What you will see shortly was actually the first Ukrainian music video ever made. Um, and it was shown then on Soviet Ukrainian television and later on all union Soviet television. This was kind of a watershed moment for Ukrainian rock music, punk rock. I'm actually writing a short book about this band. So my head is just filled with information, but I'm gonna talk only about a few small specific themes here. The first is the idea of humor, Hello. humor and defiance. So I wanna suggest that there's a kind of twinned history here. Um, in the Soviet Union often uh, strategies of when open protest was not possible, 
there were strategies of oblique humor that Ukrainians would adapt. And this might be considered a very, very oblique form of that, uh, what you're about to see. Um, one of the original band members who I'm not going to name because this person is currently um, defending Kyiv, told me that in the Ukrainian village, irony was everywhere. And this band really harnessed the potentials of irony as a form of humor and, and, and subversion um, in this late Soviet era as a particular form of late Soviet aesthetics called stjob. I'm not gonna talk about that too much here, but some people might know that there's a literature on this as well. Today, I think we're seeing Ukrainian humor deployed as a kind of offensive to Russian propaganda. Um, and so one of the things I want you to pay attention to when you watch the video is the flag that comes out. And you'll know what I mean. It's a very iconic Soviet kind of a flag. It would have been associated with uh, the Komsomol, the Communist Youth League. Um, but here it's repurposed with this totally nonsensical slogan. The slogan, instead of saying something like, you know, uh, Lenin will live forever, it says dances. Um, so the other thing I want to highlight here are the language politics that are at play. Language politics in Ukraine are incredibly complex. Uh, there are great scholars who work on this. Um, I'm going to shout out Lada Bilanyuk, the linguistic anthropologist whose book Contested Tongues has a deep dive on this. In the current moment, we're hearing a conflation between Russian language speakers and people who therefore desire to be part of Putin's Russia. And this is fallacious, and it has always been. Um, the cave underground music scene is a wonderful example of this. It was an intensely Russian speaking scene in a quite Russian speaking city at the time. Russian had become the dominant language of the Soviet Union, of course. Ukrainian language had been alternately suppressed um, at periods during the Soviet uh, period. And so many people have told me the story of how hearing this Ukrainian punk rock band sing in the Ukrainian language was a kind of rupture, moment of rupture. And this includes Eugene Hutz, who at the time was like a 14 year old teenage super fan of the Kiev rock scene, um, now is, is globally known as the Romani punk frontman for Gogol Bordello. He told me that if in that scene, they made little distinction really between Ukraine and Russia. Um, but he remembered how revolutionary it was to hear Veve sing in the Ukrainian language and how it moved the nonconformist punks and the metalheads towards stronger identification with Ukraine in the last years of the Soviet Union. I want to argue here that decommunizing projects can be decolonial projects as well. And I want to make that argument without endorsing the 2015 decommunization laws that Ukraine passed in a moment of intense nationalist fervor among the political elites. So this is a complicated thing I've just said. Among other things, those laws in 2015 condemned the communist and Nazi totalitarian regimes and prohibited the propagation of their symbols. They are controversial laws among Ukrainians, but they have also characteristically been overblown and made into a kind of media hysteria by Russian state media now partially used to justify what is a neo-imperial invasion. So Putin's speech where he directly looked at the camera and said, we will decommunize you, was in direct reference to these laws. The narrative of left bank, which is the Eastern part of Ukraine versus the right bank, which is the Western part of Ukraine, this narrative of the split between East and West um, is often thought about as mapping onto language practices. But I also wanna challenge this. This is not fully accurate. Kharkiv, Kharkov, this beautiful city that has been just devastated in recent days by Russian advances um, is a great example of this. This is a city in which many people do speak Russian. However, it is also the home. It was also in the early 20th century, the home to Hnat Khotkevich, who is a fascinating champion of Ukrainian music. And it is today home to Serhi Zhadan, Ukraine's contemporary poet rock star, who has, who has been tweeting through the destruction of his city by the Russian military. 
So language politics are not so simple. The third is post-Soviet and anti-imperial consciousness. So I've been in interviewing people in this underground late Soviet scene since 2019. And as with any group of people, there are diverse views. But there is a significant cohort of these people who told me that in the moment really didn't think of Veve's choice of language as being political in any way, right? Um, however, over the years, as, as formerly colonized subjects who were denied an accurate history of Ukraine and instilled with a sense of inferiority for being or for speaking Ukrainian, they have reconsidered some of that. I'm not going to name names because, again, these people are on the ground right now in many cases, but it is a really striking comparison to put these testimonies against the writing of canonic anti-imperial thinkers, decolonial thinkers, like Albert Mani, the Tunisian, um, the Tunisian writer who wrote so poignantly about the complex mixture of love and hate that a colonized subject might have towards their colonizers. And specifically for the cultural attributes that colonizers denigrated as part of an assimilationist and often a civilizational project. So this is a conversation that demands more qualifications than I can give right now, but I'm just gonna end by noting that one of the Facebook groups that I follow, have been following for this research, has just this week renamed their group from using the Russian translation of Kiev, K-I-E-V, to the Ukrainian one of K-Y-I-V. And many members of this musical community are actively involved in humanitarian and military defense efforts. Okay, I am going to now play, I would like to play the entirety of this music video. It's two and a half minutes long. And I wanna remind you again that this was the first Ukrainian music video ever made featuring the um, punk band Vopli Vidoplastova and their song Tansi. Лягай ти, він віддає свої надії ночі. Робітники заморились працювати. Там вогні яскраві плющуть лампи. Прихати люди на вечір у клуб. Там будуть танці. Там, там, там танці. Вспоминаем целый тиждень Багато є балачик та думок Ждемо, коли прийде добра неділя Танцем запрошує нас У клубі були любі танці Та-та-та танці Добрі, добрі, добрі танці Ла-ла-ла танці turn my video back on right now. There we are. Okay, thank you. Um, so the flag. 
flag, right? This is an example of some of this kind of very oblique strategies of using kind of humor and defiance. Um, I'm gonna move on now to the third example, which is the song 1944 by the singer Jamala. So Eurovision fans will know this song. This was performed at the Eurovision Song Contest in 2016, where it won. This was the second time that Ukraine's entry to the Eurovision Song Contest won. The first time was in 2004 with Ruslana's Wild Dances. Eurovision Song Contest, for those who don't know, is a kind of annual pageant where pop, often campy pop, and geopolitics collide. In 2016, there was a scandal, as there is almost every year at Eurovision, but in this year, it revolved around this song, in part because uh, the Russian contingent said that it was a political song and therefore violated the rules of the Eurovision Song Contest. So I wanna ask why was the Russian delegation so sensitive? The song is about 1944, ostensibly at least. That was the year that Stalin ordered the total de deportation of Crimean Tatars from the Crimean Peninsula. This is an act annually commemorated on May 18th and remembered as the Surgun by Crimean Tatars. This deportation was an act of genocidal erasure of a people who had been losing their presence on the Crimean Peninsula, which they had ruled for centuries and considered today their only home since the Russian imperial annexation of Crimea in 1783. So I really wanna underscore that when we talk about Crimea as being eth majority ethnic Russian or that it was already so Russian that it should be reunited with the Russian Federation, that this is really a fairly recent history. Crimea was annexed into the Russian empire by Catherine II and there was a huge flow of outflow of migrants then. There was another outflow during the Crimean War. And then in 1944, there was an attempt to decimate the entire population and resettle them in Central Asia. At that point, the Soviets also moved in mostly ethnic Russians and reconfigured that space as a space of Soviet Russian, Soviet naval power, let's say. Crimean Tatars, after launching a, a quite inspiring human rights battle for two decades, finally won the right to return to Crimea in the late 1980s. And in the 1990s, they began to appeal to the independent Ukrainian state for indigenous recognition. This was really more in the early 2000s. Through the United Nations, that was the kind of apparatus they appealed to. So Jamala's song is ostensibly about this atrocity from 1944, but when she sang it in 2014, 2016, it was two years after her home, Crimea, had been illegally annexed back into the Russian Federation. So it had very strong overtones. This was, again, this was 2016, right? So two years after these little green men, these soldiers with no official insignia infiltrated the peninsula and held this gunpoint vote on annexation. This then resulted in many Crimean Tatars going to mainland Ukraine as internally displaced persons. And for those that remained, they have faced um, an array of human rights abuses, the disestablishment of their indigenous ruling body um, and continuing repressions. Jamala has been based in Kyiv in recent years. She has recently relocated, but her husband is currently fighting against the Russian military. So I wanna also suggest that this performance at Eurovision, Jamala was Ukraine's representative, right? A Crimean Tatar singer displaced from Crimea, participating as emblematic of Ukraine, that this also suggests a kind of Ukrainian Crimean Tatar solidarity, a kind of tenuous, perhaps post-colonial solidarity, not a universal one, but one that I think we should not ignore. This is somewhat surprising if you happen to know the longer sweep, the longer historical sweep of Ukrainian Crimean Tatar relations, but it is less surprising when you consider that this solidarity is founded on a common opposition to Russian subjugation. So when you listen to this song, the chorus builds in two lines from the refrain of one of the most famous Crimean Tatar protest songs from the 1960s, Ey Guzel Kurum, Oh My Beautiful Crimea. 
It also references a traditional Crimean Tatar song thought of as dating back to the period of the Crimean Khanate, so before the annexation in 1783, called Arafat Dago. And so this is also a deeply intertextual song. It refers to a sovereign history of Crimean Tatarness, right, that has now found a place in alliance with the Ukrainian project. The song is three minutes long. I'm checking the time and I'm hoping um, to most of it. So um, listen to 1944 um, from Jamala. Resonances, unfortunately, tragically in this moment. Okay, the last song that I wanna talk about today is a song called Nezuritsya Khlotsi. Don't worry, boys, uh, by the Pushkin Klezmer Band, which is based in Kyiv. And this is a band led by the very charismatic clarinetist Mitya Gerasimov, who actually moved to Ukraine from Russia because he was so taken with Jewish music and wanted to be in a place where it had developed, where it had a very deep history. He has also um, a number of other projects, including um, Crimean Tatar projects. He's done a lot of work also with Crimean Tatar musicians. So klezmer music was an essential piece of Ukrainian musical history. Klezmer is a wedding party music, the party music that often is played at, at weddings in much of Ukraine. Um, Jewish musicians were a kind of professional class, klezmorem. This was one of the few jobs that Jews were allowed to hold under the various anti-Semitic imperial and local laws in both the Russian and the Austro-Hungarian empires between which Ukraine was divided until 1914. There are many melodies that are shared between the Ukrainian and Jewish repertoires. As you can probably imagine, Jewish culture in Ukraine was severely devastated by World War II. Um, though there were Soviet projects of archiving some Jewish materials, including the famous Petrovsky collection. The last few decades since the 1990s have seen a revival and a rebuilding of Jewish culture in Ukraine, and this includes klezmer music. There's an annual klezmer festival and more. There's also pilgrimage routes to holy sites. There are synagogues that have been built, many of which are threatened at this moment. And just today I saw a really emotional appeal of a rabbi in Kyiv to his Russian colleagues saying, how can you endorse this? So I wanna speak a little bit about antisemitism in Ukraine. And this is a very difficult topic to cover in a short amount of time. So please understand again, that these are very broad strokes. I wanna assert that the Jewish population existed on the territory of Ukraine for centuries. I also wanna assert that the history of Jewish in relations has been marked by violence at times. And at times this was, these were the violent pogroms that were in service of Ukrainian national or xenophobic attempts at state making, nationalist or xenophobic attempts at state making. At other times, this was violence stoked through imperial powers who benefited from having warring subjects. But I don't wanna sound like I'm just, uh, you know, excusing or diminishing any of this. I also want to say that the caricature of all Ukrainians as the great transhistorical anti-Semites is a caricature that has served more powerful actors, including Russian imperial ones and later Soviet ones. And in particular, there is a convenient illusion, a kind of blurring of Ukrainian nation building efforts with anti-Semitism that was an explicit project of Soviet propaganda and one that resurfaced very powerfully during the 2013-2014 Maidan revolution, when Ukrainians, seeing that they're being depicted as neo-Nazis and neo-fascists in Russian media, recoded the language of Russian propaganda. And this resulted in really bizarre and kind of shocking new formulations. So without going too deep into this, one of the terms that um, is a kind of shorthand for Ukrainian fascism is Banderite, B-A-N-D-E-R-I-T-E. -E. It's named after a leader of the Ukrainian insurgency with a very violent history, unfortunately, during World War II. So during the Maidan revolution, you saw people proudly, you know, waving flags that said, I am a Jewish Banderite. 
or I am a Crimean Tatar band, right? right? This kind of reappropriation of these old problematic symbols. So when Putin tells us today that he's going into Ukraine to denazify it, and this is, again, one of the rationales that he has given us, I wanna say that this is patently absurd. President Zelensky is himself Jewish. He was voted in by a huge majority of the Ukrainian population in the last election. And that's perhaps the most obvious point that one can make. It's been made by every pundit who overnight became a Ukraine expert on social media. There are some neo-Nazis in Ukraine today. I don't wanna deny that that is also present but they hold no formal political power compared to their neighboring Eastern European countries, which are members of NATO, by the way. And they have in many cases been funded by the Russian state. So understanding that there's a kernel here, I don't think that this amounts to evidence that ordinary Ukrainians today are hostage to a regime that is controlled by quote, drug dealers and neo-Nazis, end quote, as Putin so angrily argued in one of his recent addresses. So I am going to play for you, um, and as you listen, if you are um, familiar with Ukrainian traditional repertoires, the melody that comes in at about a minute and a half is what Ukrainians might recognize as a hopak, it's definitely a melody that I remember dancing to in the diaspora Ukrainian summer camps. So again, we can see just how deeply interwoven these histories are. Okay, here we go. I'm gonna turn off my video first this time. Ah. Ще й з нами буде, ми поїдемо до корчовки 
thank you. Thank you to all the people who are contributing and, and adding some really wonderful detail here um, in the chat. So if you're not looking at the chat, I really encourage you to look at that. Um, okay, so. In this moment of crisis, Ukrainian culture and history are at grave risk again, as Putin's project to erase Ukraine advances. And this includes culture and history beyond the musical. So one non-musical heartbreaking example from this week is Maria Primachenko's art. This is um, a naive, often called a naive artist from um, Ukraine, whose work was destroyed in recent days when Russian forces attacked the city of Ivankiv. This piece is called Atomna Vina Buit Proklata Vina, May That Nuclear War Be Cursed. It has been making the rounds on social media for tragically obvious reasons. But I wanna end on a slightly more hopeful note today because I'm searching for a glimmer. Now as so many colleagues and family members are. And so this is another image from Maria Primachenko. Holubka Raspustila Krila Kochina Zemli Mera, 1982. A dove had spread her wings and asks for peace. <laughs> Before we sign off, I want to encourage you as we move through this time to be skeptical of narratives that only allow Ukrainians to be rabid nationalists in defense of their country. On the ground, many people have much more complex and ambivalent feelings about the project of Ukrainian statehood. They understand their post-Soviet state's failures. They understand the corruption. They understand the hypocrisies of the West and more. Many of these people still want Ukraine. Seb bude Ukraina, Ukraine will always be. Be skeptical of narratives that overemphasize NATO expansion in this moment as though it somehow justifies Putin's action critique the expansion of the NATO alliance and the militarization of the world in the Cold War, in a post-Cold War era. But what I really want to underscore is that in this current moment, it is a red herring. Ukraine's accession to NATO has not been a viable option ever, according to NATO requirements, and especially since 2014, because of the conflicts that the Russian state has had a huge hand in provoking that dismantle the sovereignty of Ukraine. When I was preparing my remarks today, I really had the desire to try to just say everything I could about this ongoing atrocity, but it's not possible to capture the immensity of what we are beholding. It's not possible for me to describe all of the other rich and complex Ukrainian musics that I would have loved to include here, but I really hope that from here you might go and listen some more. Thank you again to Kevin Bardig for making it possible for me to speak to you today. And um, please remain in solidarity with the Ukrainian people. Oh, and I think now we'll take some questions, right? Yeah, thank you, Maria, for this, this really wonderful and, and really deeply moving talk. Uh, we do have some time for, for questions, um, and I encourage anyone who has the question to, to put it into the chat, and I will read it out. Um, uh, maybe while we're, while we're waiting for that, um, Maria, I have ever, this is a really small question that I'm curious about, um, mostly because the sound cut out when you were talking about this. Um, you mentioned there was a Soviet project of collecting Jewish materials at some point. Uh, can, can you say just a little bit more about that? Yeah. So, I mean, we have an expert on the chat who I feel like I should give the microphone to. But um, so, Eve, if you're listening, please feel free to add or, or correct anything I say. This is not my particular area of expertise. But um, yes, it's Soviet era, there were multiple projects uh, that lifted up uh, Jewish culture. Um, some of them were kind of sinister in retrospect. Birobijan comes to mind, if you know that story. Um, however, there were also 
attempts to archive and document some Jewish collections, and um, that includes the Bedagovsky collection and the other archive that Eve mentioned in the chat, which is escaping me right now. Um, there were also attempts at certain points in the 1920s in particular, so this was during the Leninist policies of um, Korenizatia, which is often translated as indigenization, um, to create new infrastructures to support Yiddish language publications, Yiddish theater, um, Yiddish music, Yiddish comedy, things like that. So it was a sort of brief chapter, I would say, in Soviet, in the early Soviet period. Um, but again, I would refer you to the writings, particularly of Mark Slobin, um, who is an ethnomusicologist musicologist who has written extensively about this. Great, thank you. Thank you for the question. Um, I'm seeing in the chat also just questions about where you can access this music. So um, I think we can make it available. I don't know how easy it is to let everyone know how to find it, but I think um, I think we can put our heads together for that. Uh, and there's also a question uh, about where um, where one might donate money. Uh, very uh, at the very top at the beginning of the chat, I dropped in a link of of resources that Maria shared with me. Kevin, do you think maybe you could drop it back into the chat? Yeah, sure. Um, okay. I'll, I'll do that. Uh, there is a question here. Um, uh, yeah, I, I'm happy to take it if, if you want to focus sure, on it. Okay, thank you. Yeah, we're obviously um, improvising here. Um, so the question from, from Zachary Henderson, the subject of Jewish presence in Ukraine and anti-Semitism is intriguing. Is Putin's claim of denazifying de Ukraine well known and recorded. It is in fact, it is well known and it has been recorded. Um, you know, he's given a number of speeches in recent days and I can't recall anymore which day it was. Maybe someone else remembers because every day has felt like a year lately, but um, just probably a few days ago, he gave a speech where he looked right into the camera and said, basically like, we are going to get rid of the drug dealers and the neo-Nazis that are holding Ukrainian children and people hostage. So yes, explicit. It's like explicit as a rationale, and they've been working towards this for <laughs> years, if not generations. Um, I see another question here. Uh, many countries collecting things to donate to Ukrainians who fled to Poland. Would it be easier to get things in Poland? That's interesting. I, I wasn't aware of those efforts uh, to, to ship things to Poland at the moment. I know of people organizing on the ground in Poland, so I can't unfortunately really speak to that. But if, um, if you have specific initiatives that you're aware of, you know, anyone who's here today is welcome to also email me. My email is on the screen. Um, I'm, happy to, I'm happy to do whatever I can in this moment to share information. Um, and to counter some of the really damaging narratives that are that are circulating right now. Uh, um, so, is it, sorry, go ahead. So I see a question in the chat about um, from Ren about Vesna, Vesna by Dacha Bracha. Was the song playing? Oh, is that why I chose it? Why did I choose to play it at the beginning? Yeah, so Vesna means spring. So spring is in the ritual calendar year um, in Ukraine was, was the beginning of the year, right? It's the, the period of renewal and hope. So I think it's pretty obvious why I chose it. Um, and there's a deep catalog of Ukrainian music, all with the title Vesna. So Vopli uh, Viduplasova, some people were asking, are they still a band? One of their really famous other songs is called Vesna. I urge you to Google it, easy to spell. And, um, oh, and there are so many other examples. In the traditional repertoire, spring songs, Vesnyanki, um, are like a huge diverse body of repertoire and they vary in all kinds of forms. So there are songs that are more for dancing and then there are songs that are much more ritual in nature and they have a kind of mystical element very often. A lot of the traditional repertoires are quite syncretic. They mix together Christian and often pre-Christian elements. So um, you can also look for spring calling songs, which are literally imploring the gods 
to bring spring and this moment of hope and renewal to people. And I think this is a year where we could use a lot of people calling for spring to come. Eve, thank you for the, the yeoman's work you're doing in the chat. That's awesome. Um, yeah, I, I wanna second the, um, someone wrote about Yuri Fedinsky's efforts to revive the Kobzar tra traditions in Poltava region. And that's really worth checking out. Yuri's another really interesting example. He's someone who grew up in the Ukrainian American diaspora like me and uh, moved back to Ukraine. After, and he, I, I believe the story is that he didn't really grow up speaking the language. For me, it was my first language, but you know, some people's families didn't maintain the language practices as much. But he started playing the bandura and then eventually got interested in some of the older styles of instruments. And today is leading this really interesting revival practice um, in the Poltava region. I also really encourage people to check out Taras Kompanichenko. I can write that into the chat. Taras Kompanichenko and, um, and Kobzarski Tsech, uh, which is the uh, guild of Kobzar play Kobza players, um, which is based in Kyiv and um, is worth knowing about, although it's no longer based in Kyiv at the moment. Uh, I think there's a question from Lynn Wolf. Uh, I found your discussion of bleak humor fascinating. Was this particular to rock punk? Can you share more examples? Uh, can you repeat the question? Because I didn't actually hear this is how you broke up. Sure, sure. sorry. Uh, I found your discussion of oblique humor fascinating. Was this particular to rock punk? Uh, can you share more examples? Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, so the particular style of like late Soviet irony that I was referring to is called stjob. It's spelled, it's spelled slightly differently in Ukrainian and Russian, but the, the same term operates in both linguistic traditions. And um, the anthropologist Alexei Yurchak is the person who has really written the most about this, as far as I know, in the Anglophone literature. Um, so, and I'm writing about it right now, but that's not out yet. So um, yes, and the short answer is yes. It's, it's, um, it's a technique of over-identification with, um, with something to the point that it becomes impossible to know whether you're sincerely imitating the thing because you like it, or if you're imitating it because you're making fun of it basically, right? So you have to kind of imagine that in the Soviet Union, when they were reviewing and censoring you know, rock materials, that the kinds of lyrics that Veve and other bands in that scene were coming up with had to get through the censorship re regimes. This is a process known as litovania. And so the lyrics could be like really bland a lot of the time, um, but they would be using formulas of Soviet like authoritative discourse and in making them part of a punk rock song, kind of making it ridiculous, right? Making it absurd, revealing the hollowness of Soviet ideology at that point in history. Um, so that's one answer, but the, but the short version is also, yes, there's a lot of bands that were using Stjob as a technique, and this has been written about elsewhere. Um, I also think that for people who are familiar with like Stephen Colbert, there's a really great article called American Stjob. Um, Stephen Colbert is like an easy example for us to understand Stjob. If you ever watch the Colbert Report before you know, he became serious late night host, um, he was over identifying with like a right wing Fox News, Bill O'Reilly kind of character, right? And in that over identification, sometimes people thought he was being sincere because he was, it was such a close imitation. So yeah, uh, Chris is asking how to navigate all the information and coverage becoming available. And so I really wanna put in a plug here for the journalists of the Kiev Independent. I'm gonna go ahead and write that in here. They have started um, independent. Um, you can find them easily on Twitter and uh, they have a website now. This is actually a relatively new enterprise because the Cave Post, which was formerly uh, the kind of, I guess, best uh, journalistic English language journalism coming from Ukraine and Cave in particular, um, had a kind of 
crisis uh, where they were restricting. Anyway, I won't go into the details, but the Cave Independent has recently arisen. They could use support. Uh, they have a Patreon, I believe. They're amazing journalists. They're doing incredible work and they're really careful about verifying things as far as I can tell before posting them. So that is one source I really recommend. I think there are probably others that other people here feel confident in endorsing. And if that's the case, please drop them in the chat. It's a good question. It's really hard to navigate. And I mean, of course, all of these narratives are partial, right? So um, I think always remembering also that, that there are histories to these discourses is important. Yeah. Uh, okay, so I see a question. Kevin, is it okay that I'm just like taking what, it, what, what I'm saying? Absolutely. Okay. Um, it's the first time I've laughed in a week, I feel like. Um, so Stacy is asking, um, I referenced popular music, right? Can I share names of Ukrainian folk singers and contemporary composers? Yes. Um, so Ukrainian folk singers. So there's actually a group in New York, if any of you are in New York, that's doing this practice that's called, um, in some corners, it's called authentica, authentic music, and it's part of a folkloric revival that really started in 1979, also in Kyiv, and was, was spearheaded by a group of ethnomusicologists, including um, Yevhenia Fremov, who I collaborated with on the Chernobyl Songs Project, um, and they started resurrecting styles of singing that had been kind of ignored or, or overly stylized in the Soviet tradition. Um, they also started singing some of the repertoires that had often religious elements that were, weren't really you know, permitted under the Soviet atheist doctrine. Um, that group is called Drevo. They have one record on Spotify, but they have a deep catalog elsewhere uh, in Cyrillic, it looks like that. And um, I also would really endorse the singing of Susanna Kartenko. Um, who does this kind of very traditional style. Her group is called Bozici, uh, which I'll write in there. And they've done a lot also around dance practices. My one of my favorite interpreters and really a person I, I learned so much from in my own singing um, is Mariana Sadowska. She's an incredible interpreter and, and does takes these traditional materials and, and moves them into these incredible new places. She's been living in Germany for some years um, so she's another kind of traditional, you know, traditional crossover singer who I really recommend. Um, and then you asked about Ukrainian contemporary composers. Yeah, um, there's going to be a Ukrainian contemporary music festival happening in New York, I believe, next month, maybe this month, if it's still on. I actually don't know the fate of it at the moment, because I believe some of those people were coming from Ukraine. Um, I would recommend, if you're into like electronic compositional practice, um, Ala Zahaykevich. Um, is wonderful. And um, other names are escaping me. This is a little bit of a blind spot, honestly, for me, but there's a scholar whose name is Leah Batstone, who's at Hunter College and at the University of Vienna, who is doing a lot of work right now with classical musicians. And there's there's a whole scene, you know, there's musicians in every part. Uh, right now, I've, I'm a little focused on Kyiv because that's been mostly where I've been going for the last few years, but there are people all over the country who are doing really interesting stuff. Um, that's like very, that's tip of the iceberg again. You know, all of this is very deep. This is a country of 40, you know, what is it right now? 44 million or is it 40 million now? People, um, it's, a, it's a huge country also territorially. This is like, just by size, it is an enormous country. And I think people sometimes don't appreciate that. The North American imagination of Ukraine is quite limited often. Um, I'm, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not sure I'm on top of all the questions. Yeah, sure. There's, uh, there's one, uh, a little ways up, uh, one more question in, uh, Jamal's performance of 1944, the images projected in the background were the roses on fire. Is that because of the Donbass sometimes being known as the city of roses, if I'm not mistaken, can you shed more light on the meaning of that symbolism in that context? Oh, that's a great question. Um, I actually don't remember like recognizing those flowers as um, roses, but I believe that if you noticed that, that that could be the case. 
Um, she's really she's really singing about Crimea, and Donbass is is pretty far from that. It's it's um, you know it's in part of mainland Ukraine, and it's towards the eastern border. So Crimea is in the south, and Donbass is sort of there. Um, so I kind of doubt that that would be the resonance. Although if you're interested, there's another song by a group called the Dach Daughters, uh, which is called Rose Donbass. And worth checking out, this is the sister group to Dacha Bracha, who is probably, if, you've, if you know of any Ukrainian bands right now, that's probably the one you know. Um, Dacha Bracha, Rose Donbass explicitly thematizes this idea of Donbass as the city of roses. And that performance is really interesting because it merges um, a text from the 19th century poet Shevchenko with Shakespeare, with kind of like punk rock growls. And I've written about that elsewhere too. So thank you, Amy, for the suggestion um, there for where to donate. And I wanna again say that um, it's important at this time also to, anticipate and, and understand the humanitarian crisis that, that is about to really kick in. I just saw a friend in Kiev today post that the local like bodega kind of shop was just empty. Um, um, I think we're caught up in questions unless I missed one. Um, I might just also say that, you know, I'm part of a cohort of music scholars based right now in North America, um, many of whom are doing, are trying to figure out how to be useful in this moment. Uh, it can be, it's not exactly a straight line, right, from music scholarship to like war. Um, and so Adriana Helbig, who's a professor at the University of Pittsburgh has put together a 20 minute like podcast that you can assign to undergraduates if you're a teacher or you can listen to it yourself that gives different information from what I talked about today. I already mentioned that Irena Voloshina and Natalie Kononenko who's um, in Edmonton, Irena's in Indiana, are spearheading these archiving efforts to preserve some of the archives that are at risk right now as they're starting to really target more civilian areas. And oh, thank you, Joan has just put the link into the chat. So you can click on that and you can find all of those items compiled. So my take on Belarus's potential red flag operation, I think it's probably very real. I, red flags have been a longstanding strategy in this part of the world. And, um, and, unfor and we have to be vigilant. That's all I can say, I mean, one of the longstanding strategies as well has been to make it so that it's impossible to know what to believe, right? And I think the most heartbreaking conversations I've had this week are with my friends and colleagues here who aren't clear about whether Ukraine is actually being attacked or whether this is justified because of actions that the US took. And again, I, I really want to be open to the critique and to the U.S.'s involvement as being deeply problematic. I also think that this is pretty clear, that this is, this is an unjustified, unprovoked criminal act of war. Uh Maria, there's a, uh, there's a question a little bit ways back. Are, are there specific ways to help artists in Ukraine or from Ukraine? Yeah, I, um, I was anticipating that question and I thought about researching it a little bit. I, I saw that on some of their Facebook pages right now, specific groups are asking, um, are appealing to different actors. I don't know that, I don't know that there's one charity right now that I feel necessary endorsing just yet, but I think that that, that might become more clear uh, in, a, in a few days time. So if you want, I, I'm actually, I had never, I, I really don't like Twitter and I had basically not been on social media and now that's all I am doing is checking for the news and it's really got to stop. But if you want to follow me on Twitter um, and I don't endorse Twitter, but anyway, um, I can definitely, I will definitely be putting that kind of information there. So um, that's, a, that's for its flaws, right? That is a place where um, information can circulate. 
unrestricted usually to the good and the bad, of course. Um, yes, Ren's question. Um, does the Dach Theater, which is the birthplace of both Dach Abracha and the Dach Daughters, that's right, Dach Theater in um, Kiev, meaning roof, um, is there a way to support them specifically? That's really interesting. I, I haven't heard anything. Um, maybe if someone else in the chat knows, I don't know if one of my colleagues is here who, what has happened to the theater, but I, um, I know about some of the musicians who have been uh, making decisions about what to do. Some are choosing to remain and uh, are sleeping in bomb shelters and others are trying to evacuate. Um, I assume the same is probably true for members of the Dock Theater. It's really heartbreaking. And honestly, I still can't really believe that this is happening. And that isn't, um, and I think that's partly because what we've seen in the last few days is that Putin really seemed to believe that this would be easy. You know, um, one of the things that got my, sorry, I'm gonna stop opining here on politics is not actually what I do, but I will say this because I keep thinking about it and it really got under my skin. One of the things that really angered me in the first few days was seeing a right-wing news host, um, Laura Ingram, basically calls Zelensky's appeal to the Russian people, which if you haven't seen it, it's been subtitled now and it's worth watching. She called it pathetic. She called it pathetic. And um, Putin appealed to the Ukrainian military to say, basically, why don't you depose Zelensky, coup him, and then we can talk. We're like reasonable actors. I mean, it's completely delusional. Like, I think Putin really believed that the Ukrainian military might want, I, it hurts my brain to kind of try to understand the logics, but I think this is a delusional person who has really, really drunk his own Kool-Aid. Okay. Um. Sorry, I this got <laughs> far from music, but I obviously have a lot of thoughts and feelings at this moment. Not at all. Um, I, I think unless there are other questions, maybe this might be a good a good point to to wrap up. So um, Maria, let me thank you for for a really wonderful, in-depth, informative talk um, that you put you put together on astonishingly short notice. And I know that I and everyone here today are, are really grateful for um, for doing this. So thank you very much. Thank you everyone for coming. Thank you, Kevin, so much for your swift work in, in making this happen. And um, and please and you know please keep Ukraine in mind as it starts to fade out of the news cycles in the U.S. because this is really um, this is really listen to Ukrainian music, support Ukrainian artists, all that. Thank you. Great. Thank you everyone. Thank you. See you.